Hello, and welcome to Building Stories, the awards talks. My name's Emma England, um, and I'm Interim Head of Awards at the RIBA. Me and my team are responsible and have the wonderful task of delivering the Architecture Awards and Honours Programme for the RIBA. As you know, the RIBA Awards are the most rigorously judged and highly respected architecture awards in the UK. Uh, these include the regional awards, the national awards and the international prize. Our team also runs the Honours Programme, which includes the Royal Gold Medal and the Honorary Fellowships. The awards include the Stephen Lawrence Prize, the Neve Brown Award for Housing, Client of the Year and House of the Year, which we run in partnership with Channel 4. And the last episode is on tomorrow night. So please tune in. As you probably know, the RIBA awards have a single point of entry. So we work very closely with the regional teams across the UK and also Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland to deliver their regional awards program. Regional awards are the first step in the awards program and then they progress on to the national awards and this culminates then in the Sterling Prize, which is the most important and prestigious architecture award in the UK. So uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know about a few new initiatives that we've launched for 2023 for the awards programme to improve and continually review how we promote architecture and our members. We've launched a new reinvention award uh, which will ensure that sustainability remains at the core of the RIBA Awards programme. This award is for the creative transformation, adaptation and reuse of existing buildings and structures. We've also reviewed and slightly changed the criteria for the Stephen Lawrence Prize. So now, rather than judging the prize on the value of the project, uh, the award will support and promote early career architects, which means that we will be continuing to promote young talent. We've also introduced a brand new uh, discount scheme uh, for practices who may be experiencing financial hardship to maintain um, and make sure that the awards are open to as many architects as possible. And finally, is that as if all of that wasn't enough, we've actually got a new architecture awards platform. Um, it's a new, um, more intuitive, user-friendly platform, um, which is digital, um, that we've invested in for 2023, which will hopefully make your experience of entering uh, the RIBA awards a lot easier. Um, Two other things. If you'd like to join the panel of the regional awards juries, you have until Friday to do so. Um, so please um, submit an application on the online portal um, to join our panel of experts who have the wonderful task of traveling across the UK and seeing all of the amazing pieces of architecture that have been recently delivered. And finally, two key dates for you. Um, if you want to enter the RIBA awards, the early bird rate finishes on the 15th of December and then the last day to enter to make sure your awards entry is fully complete is the 12th of January. So for those of you interested, we look forward to receiving your entries. So this is the last lunchtime talk for the year. Um, and so as a special end of year celebration as the finale, we decided to uh, deliver a collection of inspiring projects to celebrate the RIBA awards. We're going to be featuring three different practices who are at different stages of their careers, all of whom have won RIBA awards. So what better way to cheer up a chilly December day than hearing about award-winning architecture? So to that end, I am delighted to be joined today by Carmody Grok, Sermon Weston, and Bennett's Associates, who are going to tell us in great detail the stories behind great architecture and what it takes to design and deliver inspiring and impactful award-winning buildings. So um, 
Welcome to all of our audience. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to ask questions as we go along. Um, the key to a great event is audience participation. So uh, please do ask any questions, uh, post them in the chat and we'll read them out as we go through the event um, and we can have a Q&A session um, later at the end of the event. So without further ado, um, I'm now delighted to uh, introduce our first guest, who is Neil McKells. Neil is an associate at Carmody Grok, um, who has delivered several RIBA award-winning projects, such as the Hill House Box, which is just outside Glasgow, and also the filling station, Temporary Structure in London. So welcome, Neil, and over to you. Thank you very much, Emma. So um, I'm going to talk about three of our projects that have won RBA awards, um, sort of 10 years between them all. So the 7th of July Memorial, the filling station and the Hill House box, which Emma mentioned. Um, so the first project, the 7th of July Memorial, um, this was a project to commemorate the 52 lives lost in the bombings of the 7th of July. Um, this is a project that was done when the practice was very small, was very young, um, and it was, I guess, a very prestigious project for the practice, but also wasn't architecture in the traditional sense. Um, the memorial is located in Hyde Park, um, and uh, those of you who have seen it or visited it, will, um, it sort of sits within the landscape of the park, away from other memorials in a nice, quiet part of the site. And um, there's a lot of, I guess, complexity in uh, designing a memorial, you have to deal with the an individual's desire to contemplate um, and have to deal with the loss that people have had. You also have to deal with some of the complexities around politics and how those memorials will be seen in many years to come, and also how um, those things can be misused and misrepresented over time as well. Um, we won the project through a, a, a small competition um, amongst a number of artists. And I think what was different about our approach was how we would work with the, the bereaved families and their friends to come together to create a memorial. And one of the key themes and ideas that we had was about the difference between, I guess, an individual's uh, loss and the collective group. This memorial is remembering an event, but it's also remembering 52 very different. Um, so we. We working with that families group and with Anthony Gorman, the artist, um, we looked at ideas around how do we commemorate a single life? How do we uh, recognize and remember there were four different locations that the bombs went off and how do we bring that all together? So that was then realized into these steel columns, um, stelae that you can see, and they are located and clustered both as a single group together but also then as four different locations where the four different bombs went off. Um, the material resolution of this project was really important. It allowed us an opportunity to create something that lasted an incredibly long time. This memorial needs to last for hundreds of years. It needs to be robust, but also the process needs to be special in our mind and it needed to represent the individuals. So we worked with casters, uh, metalwork casters in Sheffield to cast the um, steel stainless steel um, columns and through that process we uh, worked with sand because it allowed us to create different types of castings so you can see in the final resolution that there are imperfections in these and that allows that to represent the different people everyone who lost their lives in that event was different and therefore through that process there are 52 very different columns that are all however all have share similarities we also worked with specialist, um, a specialist typographer to design a font um, for that. And again, quite a careful process on how you design a font that can be cast so that each column then represents the time and the date and the location of the bombing and where someone lost their lives. Um, so here's some images of the project and you can see that array of the um, memorial as it sits together. And then also the plaque then that commemorates each individual and their names, um, again, spokely designed with the typography um, experts and cast as well. And here are the columns. It allows people to walk through them. It sits as a cluster and as a grouping, but also that it has individuals can find their moments within that project. Um, so this is a very interesting project for us. It's, as I said earlier, it's sort of not architecture in the traditional four walls and a roof, but it allowed us to talk about how we would work with groups and how we 
um, sort of do consultation through projects and also come to deal with very complex issues that a memorial comes up with. And that was something that was highlighted uh, through the RBA awards for that project. Um, the next project is the filling station. This was one of our shorter term temporary projects. It was around for just over a year and we completed that in 2014. Um, it sits at the edge of the large scale Argent development in King's Cross. So on this plan to the south is King's Cross station, uh, to the station to the left of it is St Pancras. And then you can just see in the middle by the canal is the location of the filling station. So this was always a petrol station and during the development then of the project um, this uh, we were commissioned to activate the site originally just to um, put a car showroom underneath but we um, we worked with the client to think of some other uses and ended up cladding that project then in uh, fiberglass and giving it a new identity to activate it during uh, the few years of construction in the area and to bring uh, meanwhile use to the place. Um, so the existing kiosk uh, is remain is retained, um, and then we essentially, with this fiberglass, overclad the, the building, created a new structure around it, and then created an event space that, rather than opening up to the road, opened up to the canal, something that never really happened in that part before the project for Argent, um, and then uh, designed some, uh, working again with some specialist material manufacturers, some fiberglass panels that um, were, had this uh, sort of curvaceous form to them, and they were used then to wrap the project. We decorated the kiosk uh, to activate um, to activate that space so that we had uh, life within the kiosk. And then externally, then there was this uh, bar and pizza area that could be used for events, but really created a different use for that part of London while all the construction work was going on in the background, which you can see there. Um, so throughout the year at different times and different days, uh, that brought life to that site through some quite simple architectural moves um, to create a new identity for that pavilion. Um, when that was then finished, um, all of that was designed to be deconstructed and reused. And that was then reused in our Maggie Centre project in uh, Merseyside. All of the five glass was moved up there and was used then for the Maggie Centre that exists at that hospital now. Um, and then the final project uh, I'll talk about is the Hill House Box. This was completed in 2019 and uh, it's a project to um, protect uh, the National Trust for Scotland's uh, Macintosh designed Hill House. Um, if I just quickly flip to a video now that will just sort of show the project in use. Um, this project was trying to deal with the project that the National Trust have. They have a Macintosh house that is slowly decaying due to the way that Macintosh designed it and the climate in Glasgow and they had a problem of how do they protect that house um, over a long period of time. The solution we came up with right and protect the house, but also creates this um, really interesting experience where people can walk around the house and they can see conservation happening in real time, but they can also experience the Macintosh house and the surrounding environment in a very, very, very different way. Um, so I'll flip back to the slideshow now. Um, so those of you who don't know Macintosh's work or the Hill House, it's, uh, it's one of Scotland's most important uh, buildings, one of Macintosh's most seminal pieces of work. Um, it's located in a town called Helensborough, which uh, on this map on the right, uh, the that conurbation is Glasgow, and then Helensborough sits up uh, on the top left-hand corner there. And it's um, it's quite an interesting plan form. It's a gridiron town, much like Glasgow, and it was originally a sort of commuter area for wealthy uh, wealthy residents of Glasgow. And you can see just at the top of that plan is the Hill House sitting right at the top of the hill with this amazing view down to the Clyde below. Um, so sort of a really fantastic place to build a house. Um, the house was built for a publisher called Walter Blackie um, and built in 1903, um, sort of remarkably contemporary design for that period of time. Macintosh was influenced by works in Spain and by in Japan and sort of created this smudged render around the house, which created um, a very untraditional approach at that moment in time and that's what makes it so special and the interior as well is everything has been designed Macintosh and his wife Margaret designed every piece of furniture and every item within the within the house which was really really special um, but it's been decaying over time the um, the weather has uh, decayed and Macintosh's use of uh, a cement concrete render has uh, broken down over time. So that Harling has been attacked by weather for many, many decades and now has resulted in 
the house being soaked and wet inside. So rather than just covering the house up in a box as you traditionally would, so this is another National Trust project, um, the house has been allowed to be opened up. Um, we sort of understood how scaffolding works from some of our other projects that, that were scaffolding. This project in the foreground was a temporary pavilion made from scaffolding. And we realised it wasn't quite the right project for this. So instead, we designed a bespoke uh, field hospital, really, that goes over the top of the Hill House, um, designed to last for about 15 years while the conservation work happens. And then introduced a new visitor centre. You can see in the model here on the left, the visitor centre underneath that box and then some walkways over and around the house. Um, so it's sort of a very radical different way to think about conservation, allowing people to see the activity happening, allowing the house to dry out passively um, and creating a sort of new, uh, a new experience for the National Trust during that. Um, obviously we had to decide what to make that box from and uh, influenced by many different sources, uh, chain mail seemed to be the right approach originally used in historic uh, battles, but now really just used in police stab fests. Um, we came to an approach um, of using chain mail that what was really, I guess, interesting and clever about that is it allowed us to, it allows visitors to see the house throughout the year. So over on the outside, you can look in and see the house. Um, it also uh, protects water. So water trickles over the chain mail, um, stops it going into the house and getting the house damper and allows the house to dry out naturally instead. Um, it's a very interesting process. It's made uh, part by machine, but part by hand, so it can be fully disassembled and reused um, on another project when it's no longer used. Um, and it has this visibility in and out. It's um, it's quite you know it's very nice when you see it in real life. Um, and it also allows you when you're inside the box to look out and see the landscape. So rather than glass, which would have lots of reflections, it would have a different environment to control. The chain mail sort of allows the air to flow through the house to dry out naturally, but you still get these fantastic views in and out. Um, we worked again sort of with lots of specialists to see how to construct this building. So using the technology from oil rigs, the technology from pylons on how do you manufacture that and create the biggest pieces you can prefabricated, bring them to site and carefully lift those over the house um, and sort of touching the ground as light as possible all the way around. So that was then built around the house and then the chain mail then was draped over the um, over the structure and sort of hung then by these Glaswegian steel workers who then sewed it together, something that they'd, they'd never done before, which was an interesting um, learning experience on site. But that came together to create the, the box in the end. You can see the walkways then that go around and over the top of the house. Um, so it creates a sort of very unique experience for visitors that you can see a house a bit like a it, it's as if it's as if it's in a museum case. It's uh, its scale and proportions change during during that work, um, and then that's um, so that's the the project you can see there the final image of the building and all of the items uh, within it. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, that really is wonderful. Um, I've actually visited this project um, and it was the most incredible experience to go up, to move up through the stairs. And you're very conscious that, you know, you're seeing the roof and the details um, of the of the of that kind of you know really well known building um, that you will only be able to see for that point in time you know whilst that structure exists so it's a fascinating kind of experience that you've created in a really creative way you know the whole thing looks like a wonderful kind of sculpture yeah it's absolutely great we've got some questions coming in um, so. A uh, question for Neil here uh, before we move on to the next presentation from Emily. Uh, Emily says, beautiful project. What were the challenges of conserving such a prestigious building uh, for the Hill House box? Um, I think the main one for us was uh, the concern of what had happened to the other Macintosh uh, building, the, the School of Art, which actually mm. burned down twice during the the design and construction of this project. So I think we were very, very concerned about fire. So really looking to have no hot works or things like that. Um, so that was one of the key concerns. And I think also how how you have to be respectful to the building and not just doing a Macintosh pastiche. I think a lot of mm. uh, Macintosh work is uh, often sort of use all the motifs of Macintosh, but we wanted something that um, was respectful to the building, uh, stood apart from it um, and allowed the, the building to be the sort of the real 
hero in the, in the architecture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In a, and, and it's contemporary as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a great project. Okay, well, thanks, Neil. That was great. Wonderful presentation. We're now going to move on to our second presenter, uh, Tom Sermon from Sermon Western. Um, and Tom's here um, also to talk about some delightful projects. Um, Serpton Springs um, that I was actually luckily enough um, able to visit as part of House of the Year um, and also Hackney School of Food which is the other award winning project um, as well as um, another one as well I think you're going to share with us Tom so over to you. Um, yeah so I'm going to talk through um, three projects um, similar to Neil that kind of span uh, from earlier in the practice's history um, to um, closer to the present day. First of those projects is um, a project called Cork Study. This was our first um, experience of the REBA Awards process and uh, the project was shortlisted for a regional award in 2016. Um, this is a small garden room for a musician and seamstress couple. Um, it's uh, uh, They had a tiny garden in North London and we inserted this simple timber structure which is clad in uh, cork. Uh, here you can see a view of the inside. It's entirely lined in plywood. Um, but the, the sort of innovation, I suppose, on this project was the um, cork cladding, which acts as the rain screen and thermal insulation. Um, we're not totally sure of this, but we think that at the time it was the first new build in the UK to use this material, which is um, perhaps more commonly used in Portugal, where a lot of the cork a lot of the cork originates. Slightly funny story with this one is that we we made the shortlist and in, invited the clients um, to the awards, and very excitedly they invited their nephew who was um, into architecture and looking for a career in architecture. So we're all there on the night, and uh, lots of projects did win that night, but sad, sadly we weren't one of the lucky ones. Um, so. Um, but it, it didn't deter us, and we um, realized, I think, it, in that moment, how rigorous the judging process was for the Reba Awards. And I remember the visit to the court study; we could barely fit all the all the judges in. Um, so this was um, our first experience of that process. And then I'm now going to talk through a couple of more recent projects um, where we were fortunate enough to to win some uh, of Reba Awards. Um, just before I move on, here's the plan and, and section of the, the court study. So the, the second project I'd like to talk about is Surbiton Springs. Um, this is currently on the shortlist for the uh, RIBA House of the Year. As Emma mentioned earlier, the, the winner will be revealed tomorrow night. So we've got everything, everything crossed for that. But we're, we're really delighted that um, the project made the shortlist and was the recipient of a regional award and a national award uh, as well. This project had a very unusual brief. It's set in Surbiton, a kind of suburban town on the outskirts of London, a uh, classic commuter belt where a large amount of mock Tudor architecture, these kind of mock Tudor detached uh, villas. But the client's only two references were uh, a Palm Springs villa and a New York Kind of industrial loft apartment so the architectural challenge that we we enjoyed trying to resolve and play with was how to reconcile these these very different um the kind of mock Tudor vernacular of Surbiton uh, and the industrial palm springs um uh, with some art deco as well there's a very um grand art deco train station in Surbiton that was a strong reference for the project and so the aesthetic resolution of that was where mock tudor um you kind of have this applique timber framing um we enjoyed trying to sort of play with that language and and subvert it so we kind of developed this structural system using um a steel exoskeleton which is then infilled with uh, masonry um panels so the the mock becomes kind of mock mock tudor and in, in, in for this house the steel is acting structurally it's the material of modernity not not tudor times and we enjoyed playing with this kind of modern scaled up approach of what a mock tudor building um could be and so another another example of that is the critar window um 
here you can see on the street facing elevation is um, in many ways can be seen as a scaled up uh, leaded window. And so I'll very quickly run you through the um, spatial approach as you move through the house. The house is more private on the street facing elevation, as you've just seen in the previous slide. And then it breaks down towards the, the back um, where there are a more expansive views out to the secluded garden. In terms of the spatial experience of the project, you move firstly into this dramatic triple high entrance hallway highlighted here in yellow. And here's a photograph of that space looking through to a more compact space. And that more compact space is highlighted here again in yellow. So there's this moment of compression between the, the dramatic vertical entrance and then down into this compressed darker hallway space. And the, the kind of sequencing there is designed to heighten the reveal of this um, panoramic space, which then looks out onto the garden highlighted here in yellow. Here's the two first spaces, and then you move through into this um, panoramic um, column free space with views out onto the onto the secluded garden. The column free nature of that space was was achieved uh, through this uh, steel exoskeleton. So the the roof structure is working as a very large trusses, which enabled this um, large 11 meter column free span. And here you can see in that main living room space, looking back towards the fireplace and the hearth. Um, the the rooms at ground floor level are allowed as are arranged as an enfilade sequence so they all give on to one another the client was very specific that she didn't want an open plan box but the spatial solution was to develop uh these enfilade rooms that could be opened up at, or closed off so that the house can be an open box but it can also be compartmentalized down into the specific functions for each room uh, here's the first floor plan. So the first floor is accessed via the, the stairwell from the main entrance hall. And at first floor level, we have two bedrooms, two dressing rooms and two, two bathrooms. All of the first floor rooms are within the roof of the house. And part of the reason for this was to overcome planning challenges with views out. So uh, the photographs you can see here, um, the view looking out from the master bedroom, this is the only horizontal view out from the first floor level. And we have this covered veranda area, which provides solar shading to the ground floor. Um, and then also in, um, yes. provides this indoor outdoor space to sit um, outside the bedroom and enjoy the kind of best and the worst of the, the British weather. And the final project I'd like to uh, talk through is the Hackney School of Food. Um, this project, um, we're so delighted to, uh, that this was the Stephen Lawrence Prize winner this year and was also named as the um, RIBA Small Project of the Year in the London region. The project converts a former and derelict um, school caretaker's house into an educational teaching kitchen and gardens. And here you can see highlighted in orange um, our portion of the uh, site. And the, the, the caretaker's house is attached to a primary school in Hackney called Mandeville School. And um, we were initially given this kind of this area highlighted in orange to bring to life this food education center. Here you can see a couple of images of the um, of the caretaker's house as we inherited it. It had been derelict for about five years. It was uh, a bit of an eyesore on a fairly prominent um, corner. The school children used to refer to it as the spooky house as they kind of walked past on their way into school. And the, ra the sort of design rationale on this project was to target all the spending and design time and energy on the areas where we could make the most educational impact. The, the project was completed for um, a construction budget of 309,000. So it was extremely tight budget. And very early on, we agreed with the client that we would really focus on everything, every decision, every um, move we made was driven by how can we, how can we maximize educational impact? And so where we're not providing, where we're not making changes that do that, everything is done in a light touch way. 
uh, we're not precious about anything. And so in this image, you can see there's this functional datum established, um, which is um, the kind of red Viroc you can see up to splashback level. Everything below there is very well considered, lots of design time, energy and money, and everything above is very loose fit and light touch. Here you can see uh, the space in action. Um, it can accommodate uh, 30 children, so visiting schools can bring a whole class and the cooking uh, stations are all height adjustable. So uh, young kids can cook in just as much comfort as adults. These images uh, kind of show this unprecious approach where we made uh, adjustments. Openings are simply bricked in. We weren't fussy about cleaning up um, around new window reveals and uh, simple concrete lintels and different brick details and coursing uh, collide. Um, here's the uh, uh, short section of the building and the long section of the building. In these drawings, you really get a sense of how everything is kind of exposed and on, and on show and um, very much unprecious. Um, one of the major challenges was improving the street frontage. Um, so we worked with um, graphic artist Jean Julien, who designed this wonderful mural where the kind of chefs are holding up the oven. And the only new structural opening we made was the, the oven door um, if you will, which acts as the signage for the project. Um, we also introduced new openings to the site and improved the fencing to make it a, a warmer and more hospitable presence on the street. The teaching gardens are designed to double up as play space and there's a series of step planters that gradually ramp up to worktop height and um, there's a pizza oven in the background. And we, again, this kind of idea of uh, simple interventions to maximize educational impact, a simple cafe style awning um, provides outdoor teaching space and somewhere for the kids to eat their, um, their dinner once they've they've kind of harvested the produce from the gardens and, and cooked their food. Other simple interventions included uh, rainwater harvesting. So we have a large agricultural, agricultural water butt that collects water from the roof. The children then fill their watering cans from this and go off and, and water the produce. Um, We've subsequently continued working on the school and um, the site has been kind of dramatically expanded to take in um, an area of underused playground. And so this is a kind of working master plan that's gradually being delivered as funding becomes available. And um, finally, just to, to wrap up, um, part of the initial brief was that the project was replicable. Um, and so we've over the last year, year and a half, been developing a, a manual that um, is about to go live in January. It'll be um, a freely accessible open source um, manual that will be downloadable from the Chefs and Schools and Hackney School of Food website, as well as our own. And it provides um, practical advice for other schools and community groups wishing to do something similar in their area. Great. Thanks, Tom. That was wonderful. Really great. Um, I know from visiting Serpentine Springs how wonderful that project is. I really loved uh, when I went round um, the impact of that triple high entrance hall with the stair is amazing. I loved it. I also remember how incredibly tidy it was and how amazing every single space smelt in that place. <laughs> she must have spent a fortune on diffusers and gorgeous <laughs> candles. So, uh, yeah, so congratulations on the shortlist as well. And uh, we'll all be keeping everything crossed for you tomorrow night. Um, so good luck with that. Uh, we've got some questions coming in from the audience. Um, uh, I'm going to ask the one um, from Louise, which is about clients and uh, briefs. Um, she says, um, with the Surbiton House, did the client come to you with an already strong brief, um, which allowed, which also allowed you to determine such a strong design approach? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the the client's brief wasn't particularly strong or fleshed out. She 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 really did only show us these these kind of two real reference mm -hmm. images. Um, mm -hmm. But as we went through the design process, it was a, 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 a I'd say it was a very robust and a healthy client relationship. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the client certainly had no problem telling us when she didn't like things. Mm -hmm. And the, the, her honesty helped us kind of work together, I think, to resolve the brief and make the, make it stronger throughout. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, I mean there was there was um, it was fairly open at the start, and um, I remember the first presentation. The, what we presented didn't really go down particularly well, but uh. with a bit of time, it, it kind of. Um, uh, I think as an idea, um, the client came round to it, and then we kind of began to work together on how to make it stronger. Yeah, yeah, and obviously with great effect. Oh, so thanks you. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, Tom's going to be joining us again later for the joint Q&A. Um, but before that, I'm now going to hand over to our third and final uh, presentation. Um, two speakers going to be joining us from Bennett's Associates, uh, Rab Bennett and Joseph Yates, who are going to be talking about another collection of award-winning projects from their practice. So over to you, Rab. Thanks very much. Uh, I, we're going to talk about a theatre, uh, a corporate design headquarters, and a university building. So I think it's hardly be more different. Now, the, this one is obviously the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. It goes back a, a, some way. We started it in 2005, which is the image on the left, of course. Uh, but you can see on the top right, it was a very fine building when it was first finished in the early 1930s. It was a competition-winning design by Elizabeth Scott. It's first major public building by a woman architect in the UK. The, the auditorium inside was highly flawed, though. It was a bit more like a cinema than a theatre auditorium, and it never really worked. So our brief was to have a really good look at that, not to demolish the building, but to see if we could insert a new auditorium, revise the building, get it back to something like its original quality in other respects. Um, so we started with a series of master planning studies. So this looks at the theatre on the riverbank. It's actually in the floodplain, and water does surround it quite often. Uh, but it's got walkways along the river which were obstructed, a bit, and the one on the right at the top there goes to Holy Trinity Church. The other ones work, work their way through the town, and we found another site on their land which allowed us to make a little office building. Uh, so we could build that first before decanting people from the theatre in order that the theatre could be rather smaller than the brief as it currently was because it had lots of administration in it as well and that made it an easier fit. Um, and these drawings are probably quite small so I won't go through them in, in detail but the, the key point really is to look at the, the auditorium on the left in the top left hand corner of the existing building and the auditorium on the right in the way we left it. And what we were trying to do was cut down the distance from the back rows of the auditorium, the, the, the cinema-like auditorium. The distance is about 32 meters to the stage from the back rows. And what we got it down to is less than half that, it's about 15 meters. And we've done that by creating a, 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 a stage through the center of the space and an auditorium that, in the words of the director, Shakespeare might have recognized with columns around the edges and upper galleries, as well as stalls all the way around the stage. So it was a very dramatic change. And of course, it all had to be inserted within the shell of the existing listed building. Um, we did lots and lots of models. Some of them were big enough to sit inside so you could see the auditorium. But we also had to do illustrations like this one on the right, which explained to a lay audience for fundraising purposes how complex this building was and why it was going to need 50 million of lottery money and so on, which it got, incidentally. We finished it on, on budget, which we're very proud of. Uh, but you can see how the auditorium is inserted within the existing building. And that's an indication of how complex it was taken from the top of the tower crane. So we had to take away the offices, which are on the right hand side to the new accommodation, which is why there's a gap in the facade. And otherwise, we kept the shell of the building around this piece of the new auditorium. And the space between them is quite an engaging space. And the flight tower, as you can see, is in the distance at the top of the slide. And looking at the building from the, the gardens alongside, you can see we added a floor to the top of the building for a restaurant. We also added a circulation tower on the right. And that was because there was really no room for lifts and stairs and the building it was so tight so we took the opportunity to put them outside the building extend it right up to the skyline and have a fantastic view so you get a view across Stratford to the tower across the bricky buildings of Stratford on Avon and from the top of the tower we see Holy Trinity and the river through glass louvers which open for cleaning and then inside that's the space on the left there that I mentioned between the new auditorium and the old shell um, the gap is actually floored by pieces of the timber from the old stage uh, so you're actually treading the boards yourself without perhaps realizing it. And on the right, of course, we ex we restored all the features we could in from the 1930s, some of which have been rather badly mutilated. More slide to go. That's the auditorium. Uh, empty, of course, but you get the sense of this colonnaded structure that Shakespeare might have recognized. A little bit like the globe, but done in modern, modern materials, which much better sight lines and thinner materials. And of course, that's the final slide to show 
how it works in action. Now, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague in London, Joe Yates, associate with the practice, and he's going to talk about Jaguar Land Rover, and I'm going to operate the slides when he tells me to. Thank you very much, Rab. So this is the Jaguar Land Rover headquarters that we designed in Gaydon, Warwickshire, and it was completed in 2019. Uh, you can see from central photo that the surrounding area is very green and quite a rural feel to it, but in reality, uh, it was the site itself was very much tarmacked, and that was really due to its use as an airfield formerly. And so you had these two great runways, which created a triangular form, and then either side of the runways were scattered a range of uh, Cold War era buildings, aircraft hangars and communication hubs and things like that, which were quite inflexible, not really fit for purpose, and didn't really do anything to speak of the kind of qualities that Jaguar Land Rover as a brand uh, seek to represent. Our vision for the site really was to create a bold new campus which could operate as a headquarters for Jaguar Land Rover. This was seen to be the first opportunity to bring both halves of the Jaguar Land Rover brand together and sit them adjacent to one another on site for the first time and create an environment that was bold and stimulating enough to um, really encourage worker retention in what's a very competitive sector and to help drive the standards of the Jaguar Land Rover company and their design output forwards um, for yeah, the duration of their time as an organization. And so part of that was this master planning approach really, which pushed a lot of what had been the tarmac heavy car parking areas to the outside of the triangle environment and create high quality green space and good quality immunity for visitors and staff alike. Thank you. Um, so across the top, you've got three of our primary uh, concepts of the scheme. On the left-hand side, you've got a modeled ground plane. It was about creating a ground floor, which was interesting um, and stepped in areas to create a kind of dynamic environment for pedestrian users, but also robustly designed enough so that vehicles could be trafficked across the ground floor in and out of the design studios and into display spaces in some of the breakout areas around the building. Um, centrally, there's a weave of connectivity, which was setting up these carefully curated circulation routes for pedestrians between the different building departments. Speaking of which, if you look at the bottom right-hand diagram, you can see the different colours of different departments which were presented in the building. And so the orange, yellow and mauve are some of the kind of office and admin type areas. And the dark green is the Jaguar Design Studio. Light green, blue and the grey represent some of the existing accommodation that was already in place there. And all of that sat beneath three um, large timber roofs. If we just go back one slide, sorry. And yeah, so that provided accommodation of about 50,000 square metres gross. And that was for 3,000 staff and new build and also facilities that serve the wider campus. Okay, next slide. So looking at some of the organisational principles for the scheme, this can really be read quite clearly from the grid. So on the left-hand side, when you see the east-west grids um, moving out and having greater spacing between them, that represents a 27-metre bay, which was key really for the function of the Jaguar Design Studio. So that 27-metre bay of column-free space presented free area for the design teams and modeling teams within the Jaguar design department. You might have simultaneous teams um, working together in the same environment. And then we transferred uh, that grid all the way across to the office accommodation on the right hand side of this plan, um, where you've got floor plates of 18 meter wide office accommodation and nine meter wide atria between them. Next slide, please. So touching on the experience of the building then, on the top image here, you've got the approach from the south of the site, which was preserved for visitors and VIPs, taking you along the kind of greened and um, with the kind of new lakeside amenity into the building from the south. The image below that um, presents the experience that you would have as an employee arriving at site from the car parks, which are distributed outside the main triangle environment and moving into the building into its northern elevation. There are some doors right in the centre of that elevation, just in the recessed bay, which leads you into an internal street, which acts much like a high street in that it's the kind of main thoroughfare through the building running right from the north to the south of it, with the departmental doors uh, moving off to the left and right. And that brings us to the next slide, please, which shows some of those key uh, internal spaces that we've created. On the left hand side, you've got one of the plate halls in the Jaguar Design Studio. It's one of those spaces that has that 27 meter span and a Jaguar car model um, sat beneath the dramatic roof light and that 27 meter spanning beam. On the right hand side, you have one of the office areas, open plan office space, either side of an atrium, which would really be like a hub um, for that with some breakout space at the base stairs providing express connections which are outside of the core areas and then those bridge links 
that really was key to the identity of both of these environments was the presence of structure and how we have to be very careful and work the building very hard to make sure that on a building with this scale we couldn't necessarily lavish an awful lot in terms of additional finishes and apply those to the scheme and that it's kind of quite raw skeleton was so carefully kept and maintained and coordinated that that gave a lot of high quality distinction to the internal character and it was something which Jacob Landry ever really felt spoke of them as a brand and what they represent. Thank you very much, Rob. I'll hand back to you. Okay, I'm going to finish off with uh, the base centre at the University of Edinburgh. This is this is a view of the complex, which is sitting in the middle of the slide, uh, looking down from Arthur's seat. And uh, it's worth saying that we started this project way back in 2003, and this is a model of the early scheme showing three separate buildings, one at opposite ends of the low rise, and then a tower as well. And the first two were built quite quickly, and then there was a long gap till we got to the third one, which is taken from a different angle as here, and that was the base centre, which started in 2014. So you can see it's it's nestling in with the original concept, but it's taken on a slightly different form simply because of the passage of time, the brief changing, and so on. Um, I, there's not really enough time to go through the plans in detail other than to say that what we were doing in all cases, in all three phases, was a uniform ribbon of space that could cope with cellular space, lecture rooms of reasonable size, and labs. And they were all taking up a common dimension that we, we made this like sausage of space wind its way around the site, around a courtyard, so that two buildings faced into the atrium, uh, the open courtyard in the middle. Um, what these look like at the ground floor, the, the base center looks like this, and it's got the robotics labs on the ground floor. It's all about digital technology, really, um, and robotics and so on. So there's an open lab which the public can go in and see. It's on the ground floor, which is uh, it's also got a cafe, which is the one on the right-hand side, and it's only the upper, upper floors which are closed off. So it's a really great place to come and visit. And you can see some of the early robots in the in the screen uh, in the cabinet next to the cafe. On the upper floors, uh, we're using a very benign low energy system with air coming through the floor plus opening windows, which means that the soffits can be left as plain concrete. So we just painted them different colors to animate the whole place and then use sculptural staircases to bring the place to life. And the staircases are wide enough to have in, you know, in unprompted meetings on them have a little bit of serendipity so people can meet from different places. And all the different occupiers, which come from many different companies as well as the university, have a place to linger. And these are a few slides showing the routes through the site. So the, the complete site is meant to knit into the, the back routes of Edinburgh and echo a street which was once there before the buildings were demolished in the 1960s. And that's the final slide just showing the east facade of the base centre. Wonderful. Thanks, Rab. And thanks, Joe. Um, I was just thinking it's a shame we didn't have the reinvention award because um, I think the Royal Shakespeare Theatre would have been a really great contender, wouldn't it? Really mm. creative uh, transformation. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I'm going to bring us all in now uh, for some questions, uh, just conscious of time. Um, and um, I'm probably going to um, combine several different questions together. Um, what I will do, um, I'll uh, if I um, combine some of these questions and then come to you, and you can ask them, you can answer them as we go round. Um, so there's several different themes coming out here. Um, one about clients, um, and I'm going to I'm going to form my own question, uh, which is um, what as practices uh, motivates you to enter the RIBA awards? Um, do you have any top tips? And how important are clients um, in terms of an endorsement um, for your awards entries? And uh, Rab, I'm going to ask that to you, first of all, seeing so, though you've just spoken. Well, they're massively important. I think they're the, the, they're the top architectural award as far as we're concerned. And of course, it might lead to other things like a Sterling Prize nomination if you're lucky. Um, the thing about RIB awards, which I like, is the fact that it's so it is rigorous. Um, all the long listed projects are visited. There's quite a strong debate amongst the judges. There's a second round of debate back at the headquarters, if you like, when all the entries mm. are being seen together and if you really feel you haven't gotten the board on fairly for some reason or if there wasn't something quite right in the entry you can you can enter a second time and that's unique so the base yeah. was one of those it was uh, it didn't quite work the first year for the judges and a different panel of judges took a different view so we're very pleased that it came through so uh, we're mm. a big fan of the RIBA awards uh, we've mm -hmm. uh, we've got quite a few notes 20 something I think it's 24. Yes 
Great, thanks. And, and Neil, do you want to um, answer that in terms of the motivations for entering awards, clients, and any top tips for people who haven't entered before? Yeah, I guess motivations sort of change through the life of the practice. I think at the beginning, it's very helpful to raise profile uh, to sort of get you recognised, and that's that is actually continually helpful throughout the the process. I think uh, you know we do a lot of public work and things like PQQs and all entering through that is often a very helpful way to um, to sort of show that your building has been recognized um, in terms of clients absolutely it's really helpful to be sort of fully endorsed by uh, your clients they can often give you sort of i guess they can help to bring alive the story of your building sort of talking about how they've used it and, and the benefits it's brought to them and i think that's you know that's really key it's not just a beautiful thing to look at it's uh, generally it's a building that people use and and enjoy um what was, what was the final question emma any tips? Top Any tips. tips. Um, I think it's just like what's that sort of elevator pitch, as it were, for your for your project or your building. How do you communicate it really succinctly and clearly um, at the beginning? I think we we spend lots of time sort of labouring over text and things like that to, to make sure those things are clear. And then uh, good photography um, and imagery is, is also really really helpful. So Tom, um, as a kind of relative newbie to the awards process, any any top tips and anything you'd do differently, um, you know, that you've learned from from the most recent experiences? Uh, I think we also, as Neil mentioned, spent a lot of time really uh, working on the awards entries and trying to make them as tight as possible. It's not that easy to communicate um everything you might like to say about a project when you're um when you're submitting for the awards um mm -hmm. and as rab mentioned i think we as a practice certainly hold the Rebra awards app as the most important architectural awards out there um mm -hmm. uh, the judging process is very rigorous and you're being judged by your peers who um, you respect and i think um for us with the Cork study, we were, the scale of the project, we were kind of um, ha very satisfied to have made the shortlist. And then but that, that going through that process on a, with a small project has, has helped us with um, the kind of more recent awards. And um, yeah, it's uh, for a small practice trying to get out there and win bigger work. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're super important um, awards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're really hoping that something will, will come come um, come of the Stephen Lawrence Prize, and um, yeah, I think um, mm -hmm. for us, they're, they're by far the most important architectural awards. I would agree. <laughs> um, uh, another one for you, Tom, um, from Hassan. Um, well, there's two actually. What would it mean for you to win House of the Year, um, and how do you think it might Im uh, impact on your practice? be fantastic for, for us um we're we're really delighted to have that the house has um made the shortlist and it's been an enjoyable process kind of doing the filming and um again that's been a, a great learning experience um mm -hmm. i think interestingly as a practice the um we were so made up with the, the stephen lawrence prize it means a huge amount to us um kind of being brutally honest here probably means more than the house of the year because that project is our first kind of um public facing project and it's and it's really making a, a, a difference to the lives of um kids in the community every, every day um mm -hmm. and um so it's been special for us to, to win that one i mean of course it'd be amazing if it goes our way tomorrow but um <laughs> we're, we're, we're very happy as we are yeah Indeed. Well, as I said, we'll we'll have everything crossed for you. Um, so I have got a question here about a project specifically for Rab and Joe. So Joe, perhaps you'd like to answer this one. Um, question from Hugh Lloyd. Um, what inspired you to enter your project to the RIBA Awards? And has it changed since the Royal Shakespeare in... 2005 to today um so i don't know if you were part of that project but um I, and perhaps it's about different motivations for entering awards over the years um i don't know if you've got anything you want to share with us on that one i mean what everyone has already touched upon with the motivation for going in for the awards what they represent and how highly they're regarded is sort of fundamental really to our 
annual process. Mm -hmm. I think they're a really important gauge of how you are doing as a practice as well, even if you're not entering them, even if you're not winning them, but also keeping track of what projects are winning and coming through. Yeah. It's an indicator really, isn't it? It's a metric of the yes. direction of good design and how that is evolving and changing over years. And so mm -hmm. perhaps there we can pick up on, you know, the journey from Royal Shakespeare Theatre and things like that, that, you know, if we were still doing designs in exactly the same way, that wouldn't necessarily show that we've made progress and developed our thinking. So I think it's mm. essential to, yeah, have um, a constant eye on what projects are coming through. And yeah, doing well. useful barometer. Great, thank you. Uh, are there anything, um, is there anything that you think the RIBA should be doing differently in terms of it, of their awards for architecture in the UK? Super quick answers. <laughs> Rab, do you want to go first? Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think you should keep aiming high. I mean, I think um, anything which compromises the quality of RIBA awards, I, avoid like the plague, just make it as as the prime architectural award in the country. And I just keep going like you are, I think, and keep improving uh -huh. it, keep thinking of new ideas uh, and not making it the same every year, but aim high. Yeah, brilliant. The rigour. Neil? Um, I think as you are doing uh, sort of bringing sustainability and post occupancy and things like embodied carbon into that. And I think the, you know, the, that is the big challenge for our industry uh, in, the, in the next sort of decade or so. So I think the more the awards can focus yeah, on the environment and uh, we'll deal with that, would be great. Great. Joe? Yeah, I think echoing what Neil said, it's essential really that the awards themselves remain relevant. Yeah. And in doing so, are tied to the current drivers for our profession, what we should be achieving. We shouldn't be gauging buildings by the same standards that we weren't necessarily 20 years ago. Um, so, yeah, as, as the buildings evolve, the awards should do also. Yeah, yeah. Yes, well, we, um, we update and renew the sustainability criteria and the requirements um, every year uh, in line with the 2030 climate challenge that the RIBA has. Um, and now you have to produce more rigorous um, sustainability information as you move up from regional, national to sterling. So that's uh, definitely our intention. And Tom, finally, comment any comments from you? Um, no, I, I just think that um, the, the, the having very specific criteria, I was really interested to see how you mentioned um, that the Stephen Lawrence criteria will be, re will be refined a little bit and be um, mm -hmm. more tailored to emerging uh, studios, I think that's great. I think then that that kind of gives that project a strong identity, and also it will represent what Baroness Lawrence and and Marco um, hope that it would stand for. Um, mm -hmm. But no, other than that, I, I think yeah, just the, the quality. I think the profession has to see the best projects winning the awards and winning the prizes like the Sterling. Right. Yes, totally agree. OK, guys, well, we're out of time. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by thanking you all for your wonderful and inspiring presentations. It's been great to hear more about your work. Um, I also want to thank those of them, uh, those of you behind the scenes, Carolinda, Bia and James for uh, making it such a smooth and slick event. And then finally, before we finish, uh, please put the 19th of January in your diaries for the next live building stories. We're going to kick off the 2023 series uh, with a House of the Year special. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much.